Hello again, everybody, and welcome back to The Accelerator with Michael Conniff. That's me. We're a podcast available on all the major platforms, um, including Audible, Amazon, Apple, also Spotify and YouTube if you're looking for video and audio. Uh, We want to uh, remind you to rank us, rate us, uh, subscribe to us, uh, spread the word. Get on our Substack mailing list. That's really important. We're getting a really amazing open rate on that, um, and it's going out to uh, nearly 10,000 people. So uh, we'd love to have you be part of that. And um, today I am very excited to be introducing Brian Will. He is a serial entrepreneur and best-selling author with two Wall Street Journal bestsellers, uh, The Dropout Multimillionaire, which I can't wait to hear more about, and also No... The site or no psychology of sales and negotiation. So a lot to talk about here. Welcome, Brian. Thanks for being with us, Michael. Thank you for having me. Excited to be on the Accelerator podcast. Yeah, well, thank you for mentioning the name. That's that's great. Um, so, Brian, there's so many things we can we, we can talk about. I, I do have to ask you, and I, I want to tease this a little bit by saying you recently had a very long conversation on Necker Island with Sir Richard Branson. So we'll. We'll save that. We'll get to that. But I want to talk about, um, let's start with the the dropout multimillionaire. What's the dropout part? So I actually failed out of high school at the age of 16, uh, managed to get back in, graduated with a 1.2 GPA. That's a D plus. Tried to go to college, couldn't do it, dropped out of college. I'm not letting you off the hook on high school. (laughs) What what, what happened? Where where did you go to high school? Was it a bad high school? What, What happened there? No, I grew up in a, uh, we'll, we'll call it a very bad home life. Uh, I was a very oh. angry young man. Uh, didn't, uh, didn't care about anything, didn't care about anybody. And so I just didn't go to school. And so the first, uh, hmm. first 90 days I skipped 42 of them and, uh, wow. when they, they, they didn't have computers back then. So it took them longer to figure it out. And then when they figured it out, they expelled me. When they figured out you weren't going to school. So you did get back and you did graduate. And then what happened to college? Tried to go to Ohio State, actually went into the military first, did some time on active duty, uh, got into Ohio State off of a military uh, scholarship, but uh, only lasted two semesters and ended up dropping out. And what, what happened there? What was the, what was the dropout story at, a, at the Ohio State University? You know, Michael, and it gets back to my childhood and my, I, I had a very unhealthy relationship with uh, discipline and with authority. And I had a professor tell me one day that if I was going to succeed in her class, I needed to jump through her hoops. And I was just not the person to say that to. And I'm not proud of this to this day because it was a mistake. But I said, I'm never jumping through your hoops. And I quit school on the spot. Why was it a mistake? Because college is important. Both of my kids have advanced degrees today. I'm a big believer in education. Uh Uh, But mentally, I was just not capable of buckling down and studying. Now, I also am very ADHD, which we didn't understand back then. Uh-huh. Um, so I had a hard time reading. Uh, unless I was super interested, I just, I couldn't read. I'd read one page and I'd be off doing something else. And so I I, I just, I couldn't do college. So a combination of uh, um, what happened in your family life, you know, a condition you really didn't understand or nobody did really at yeah. the time. Um, plus a teacher saying the wrong thing. So you're, I guess, what, uh, at that point, a sophomore, a freshman sophomore at Ohio State? I was a fresh. Well, I was technically a sophomore because I'd gotten credit through okay. the military. Oh, I see. But really, you had just gotten there and you drop out. Yep. So what, yep. what, what's going through your mind? What are you thinking at that moment? All I cared about at the age of 18 was, this is, this is going to be interesting. All I cared about at the age of 18 was becoming successful and making a lot of money so that I could prove to everybody who I thought was looking down on me that I was not the loser that they thought I was, right? It's not till later in life that you realize that that, that devil that you're facing in your mind is really you and not when everybody else. When did you else. realize that? At what point? So I'm guessing it was some years later. It was many years later, and it was a uh-huh. lot of failures and, and struggles through life and then counseling and you know going through a divorce and all kinds of crazy stuff. So um, uh, we may jump around a little bit. Your, your story is so interesting. So um, I think you are aware of the fact that, and if you're, if you're listening, if you're watching on Spotify or on YouTube, you will be able to see what I'm talking about. You actually have the word failure directly over your head. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> um, 
we can we can see execute a little bit on the mainly on the left and then on the right. I know that word success because I've talked to you before, but the word failure is a big part of the entrepreneur's journey, almost no yes. matter how good you are. Yes. Um, how long did it take you to realize that and, and what had to happen for you to realize it? You know, Michael, I say every entrepreneur when they launch into business for the first time has to go through what I call the hundred steps from where you are to success. And it's not exactly a hundred. It's, it's an analogy, but I say some people start at 10. Some people, if they've got the right parents, the right money, the right education, they might start at 50. Some people like me, I started at zero and some people start at negative 10. Really, it depends on the person, but you will have to go through every one of those lessons and every one of those failures to get where it is you want to go, whatever that mm -hmm. is, right? So we don't know where we start, but we do know we're going to have to fail a ton. Now, the caveat I put in that, and I, and I, I always cringe when people say that you have to fail to succeed because that is not technically accurate. Mm. You have to learn from your failures to succeed. Uh -huh. Too many people fail and failure leads to failure leads to failure because they never learned the lesson. You got to learn the lesson. Otherwise, the failure was a waste of time. So if I'm good at anything in life, it was learning from my failures and I failed a lot. Well, let's 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 take the first one. If you can remember, do you remember the first time you failed and what was the lesson? My very first business, uh, I started a landscaping business having no idea what I was doing, managed somehow to build it into seven franchises, and then lost everything in a matter of 30 days. How did that happen? I That's made two like a success. Seven franchises sounds pretty good. What went wrong? You would think, except we were doing all these franchises. The majority of the work we were doing was for a single general contractor wow. out of Savannah, Georgia, building giant apartment complexes. And so we had built an entire infrastructure, an entire OPEX around this individual contractor. And when they fired us because the new VP hired his son to be the new landscaping contractor, we were done. Didn't pay us, fired us, and I lost everything. So um, one easy lesson there would be don't get beholden to a single customer, right? That is the, that's the big one big lesson. And the second big lesson was have enough capital reserves or uh -huh. safety so that if you do get into trouble, you don't get into trouble. Think of what happened. It just happened yeah. in COVID. All these people got in trouble with COVID and went out of business because their businesses weren't prepared for one single downfall. And so I've never made those two mistakes again. Right. You know, that one about not becoming um, dependent on a customer, single customer. I know that very well. I had a consulting firm for 10 years and, you know, I had some really good clients. <laughs> and when you have a client like you had or like I had back in the day, uh, it's very tempting to kind of, I, I guess, rest on your laurels and, and yep. think the gravy train's never going to end. Um, so that's a great lesson, though. If you have, of, of course, of course, it's great to have a customer. That's how you have to start, right? You have to start yep. with a customer, but uh, but don't get dependent and have, as, as you said, have a backup plan. So we can't go through all the all the all the failures. But what do you, what was um, I'm really moving toward failures that led to the one you could call a success. So so what were the ones that led up to where you really could say this one worked and and, and I'm happy about what happened. You know, one of the things, again, back to my hundred steps from where you are to success, and I and one of the things I, t I teach and talk about a lot is there are ways to skip those lessons. And the way you skip those lessons and the way you accelerate your success or your growth is by bringing in a good coach or a mentor. And somebody oh. who has been there, done that, who can say, no, no, don't do that. Don't do that. This is what's going to happen. That's a bad idea. Do it this way. And I went through 20 years in business, if you remember my bad attitude, not wanting to take advice from anybody. Ah. And it wasn't, it wasn't until I found, uh, my first mentor, um, his name was Steve and he was a business partner, uh, to me that I decided one day to start listening. And when I decided to start listening, my world went from zero to a thousand in lightning speed. And well, so we... I, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, I, I, I tell the story to people all the time and it is the single, the single thing in my life that made a difference in my life, my children, my grandchildren created generational wealth was listening to one person who knew more than I did. And that's the lesson I learned. So could we, could, you know, first of all, I think, I think everybody needs a coach. I have a coach. Yep. Um, I coach a lot of people. Um, I think, I think it's very important, but there's a, there's a, there's something, there's a nugget there about this, about a coaching, which is that 
in order to be, to, if you're going to have a coach and you may be paying for them, you may not, but you better be coachable. And to me, mm -hmm. like being coachable means learning to listen. And you said that yeah. was a really big problem for you. Um, and I consider it, uh, you know, I, I don't have any superpowers, but I'm a really, really good listener. And that's because I have a journalistic background. I'm used to the asking questions to find out what I don't know. And, um, and also, um, parenthetically, when I, when I had a radio show, when I first got a talk show, I realized I've got to shut up and listen. You know, <laughs> I've got to ask the question and do the opposite of what I'm doing right now, which is shut up and listen. <laughs> um, but, but talk about, don't talk about, tell me what, tell me how listening, not just to a coach, but how, to, how, what's the, what's the best way to listen in a way that will lead to success? The most successful entrepreneurs do not have all the answers. The most successful entrepreneurs know how to ask the right questions. Mm -hmm. And that is the key. Listening follows asking the question. Jack Welch, one of the greatest leaders in, in industry in America, was famous for walking around GE and asking questions. He was famous for having going to parties and everybody wanted to talk to Jack and ask his opinion. And he would stand there and talk to other people and asking them questions. Mm -hmm. Asking questions and then listening to the answers is how you learn everything. Too many entrepreneurs think they have to know everything, do everything, be the smartest person. And that's their downfall. It's that ego that is stopping them from succeeding. You got to ask questions. You got to listen. You got to yeah. take advice. Don't be the smartest person in the room. It's funny you should say that. I was just thinking that one of my favorite expressions is um, the only the thing that keeps the smartest person from being the smartest person in the room from actually being the smartest person in the room is they think they're the smartest person in the room <laughs> before they're not listening and they're not getting any smarter. And, and I think your Jack Welch uh, uh, story is, is exactly on target. So tell me about your successes. Uh, the insurance company, we launched an insurance company, uh, sold it to a venture capital firm. Uh, it went public today. It's the backbone for all the data behind Medicare in the country. It's, it was called connection when it went public. The second wow. insurance firm we launched, uh, sold it to a venture capital firm. Today, if you buy health insurance in, I don't know, I think it's nine or 10 states now, you're buying it off of our enrollment platform or their enrollment platform now. It's wow. not mine. That's great. Um, the third company I started was an online marketing company, and we sold it to a private equity firm. Uh, that was our biggest deal. That was an $80 million exit. Uh, right. They were the largest digital marketing firm out there uh, at the time. Went on and did consulting, direct to consumer consulting, consulting, building sales teams and sales organizations and training. Have sold billions and billions of dollars in the insurance marketplace uh, through the teams we've trained. Wrote the best selling books. Uh, got on city council. I do politics now. Um, and now I work with uh, young entrepreneurs running essentially what is a little accelerator, which is why I love your podcast name. Teaching guys in that well funded to 10 million range how to really rock and roll their business or make it profitable or, or, or get it going. Um, because what do you most, call your accelerator? Where can people find it? It's called the force multiplier, the force mm.com. Um, and we Is love that, force multiplier because you're using tools and people to accelerate your business without you having to put more work in. And is that the, that is different than the force as in the force be with you? <laughs> well, the this, force was a force multiplier, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, it was the ultimate force multiplying. Yes, there you go. See, so what? Why did those succeed where you failed before? Uh, because a, we I learned to listen, and b, I brought in good teams. So one of the things I, I find that is the single one of the single biggest downfalls of the entrepreneurs in this this one to ten million range is they they don't know who they are within the business, and they're trying to be somebody they're not. Okay. This gets back to the e-myth, which I also wrap up in my book. It's there's the entrepreneur, the technician, the salesperson, and the the uh, entrepreneur manager. It's entrepreneur, manager, salesperson, technician. Too many entrepreneurs, they start businesses and they're technically the technician, but they think they're the entrepreneur. Yeah. And unfortunately, they think they're the CEO. And C a CEO is a management position. It is a manager. It's It's... It's not the entrepreneur. The CEO is generally not the entrepreneur. It's a manager. And most entrepreneurs make terrible managers. I'm a terrible manager. Yeah. I, I know this is a weakness. So what I do is I bring other people in to fill in those weaknesses. And if we can take an entrepreneur and teach them how to fill in their weaknesses with good team members and not try to have all the answers, that's why they accelerate. That's why they succeed. Um, 
that's really interesting. Now, I, I want to make sure that I leave enough time for Sir Richard Branson. So it's a, it's a measure of your um, success and influence that, uh, as, as I understand it, you got to spend um, several hours on Necker Island, which if people don't know, they should definitely Google that. It's an island that Richard Branson bought uh, years ago when he had no money, by the way. Great story. <laughs> He gets a great story and, and you should look it up and read it. It's really funny. But he get, ended up owning an island and he's sort of based himself there now. Um, and can you tell us, and, if he, and of course he's Virgin everything, Virgin Atlantic, Virgin mm-hmm. Records, before he sold it. So how did you end up at Necker Island and um, how did you get into this conversation with Sir Richard Branson? So a friend of mine, it belongs to a group called Changemakers Rule Breakers. She lives here in Atlanta. She just sold her company recently, and she's friends with Richard, and she's been to the island probably 20 times. Wow. And she, she was invited to come speak to this group of international business folks, and she called me, and she said, you know, I'm going to Necker Island. I know it's on your bucket list, and I know Richard is on your bucket list, and we're going for five days. Would you like to go? Mm-hmm. And I was like, are you kidding me? I mean, why would you even ask? We, we're, let's buy the tickets. Let's roll. So okay. I got the, I got the invitation to go and uh, not really understanding or expecting what was going to happen. But the very first day I sat down at breakfast and Richard sat down beside me and we started chatting and he was asking me about my background and my family. And I told him a little bit about my story from the beginning and uh, him and this guy, Billy, who ran the organization, they said, you know what? You're going to be one of the speakers tomorrow morning. And I was like, Really? And they're like, yep. So tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, you're going to speak and tell this story. So I got to speak to this group. I called it my pre-TEDx talk. Uh, <laughs> what did you tell them? It's called Your Past is Not Your Future. And it's about overcoming your challenges and your background and not letting using it as an excuse to succeed. And that no matter what you want or where you want to go or what you want to do, it's in your hands. It's not about your past. It's about you and it's about moving forward. So that's, that's a 20-minute speech on that. And we got to spend literally every breakfast, lunch, and dinner. We went on two island excursions with Richard. Um, and I got to spend a fair amount of time. The The big conversation we had was on Anagata Island. We went over there for lunch. Now, it was his 73rd birthday. We took the speedboat and he parasailed. So we were his safety <laughs> boat. 12 miles on a parasail at 73 years old. Got no. there. Amazing. And got into a conversation about politics and world events and just the most amazing stories you've ever heard. Like, who picks up the phone and calls Nelson Mandela? Hey, hey, hey Nelson, what's going on? You know, or Desmond Tutu. Yeah. I mean, just just crazy yeah. stories about what he's done in his life and, and getting to learn a little bit the way he thinks and how engaged he was with us each individually was amazing. And by now we know you're a good listener, so you must have done a lot of listening. What, what, mm-hmm. did, what did he say that stuck? What did he say that stuck with you? So it were after dinner one night and he was taking questions. And my question was, Richard, you're 73. Why are you still pushing? Why are you still going? Why do you still work with entrepreneurs and do loans and micro loans and build? Why do you do this? You, you're living in paradise. You can just hang out here. And he said, Brian, he said, um, if, you have an, if you have a talent and you have an ability and you can use that talent and ability to make a difference in the world, you have an obligation. And that's why I do it. And that hit me like a ton of bricks. And how did, I, that, how did that translate into your life? Well, we were talking about business. And one of the, he said, you know, if your talent is business and you can make money, then you can use that money. You can use your talent to help other people to make a difference. One of the things we did there was we were raising money to buy portable incubators for, for the Ukraine because these hospitals mm-hmm. keep getting bombed out of electric power and whatnot and, and babies yeah. are dying. So, uh, take your talent, take your abilities, use your money, use your influence, use your resources and make a difference in the world. Don't just sit back on your laurels. What else is on your bucket list? Besides world travel? Uh, I, I, besides Necker Island. (laughs) I jokingly say, I want to go everywhere and do everything before I I I die. I I, I apologize. I'm going to tell a really silly story. Um, I was in, uh, uh, Morocco on my, my honeymoon and, um, and uh, I, my digestive system required me to stop immediately. So we're just driving <laughs> along. And I said, say to the driver, you've got to stop now. Now. <laughs> he stops. There's like kind of a brick wall. And you know how everything in Morocco is sort of behind the wall or behind the door. 
And um, on the front of the door, it says, basically, I'm paraphrasing, but Richard, Sir Richard Branson's Moroccan Paradise. <laughs> <laughs> Just completely by chance. And guess what? It's a beautiful resort. We, we, we hung out for a while. That's nice. the only Branson story I have. Not, not <laughs> Yours is much, much better. But um, so so let, can we talk a little bit about because we are the accelerator, this podcast, and um, you run your own accelerator. Can you tell us about what um, I'm sure a lot of people listening are going to say, gee, I, I would love to get into um, Brian Will's accelerator. What, what do you look for? What are the what is what is your criteria? Uh, we call it well-funded startup through 10 million in revenue. And I do that for a reason. Well-funded because I don't need you worrying about paying the mortgage when we're trying to build your business, right? If you're trying to build your business and you can't pay your rent, that's a problem. I can't really help you. And through 10 million in revenue, because I feel like it's that bucket of entrepreneurs that are probably struggling the most with getting their business rocking and rolling. By the time you get above 10 million, you've probably got an advisory board, a board of directors. You've learned some things you need to learn. And plus, mm -hmm. You know, I've only built one company that hit $30 million in revenue. The rest of everything I've done has been in that 10 million range. So I feel like I'm very good at teaching that. And as I like to say, sometimes coaches are for a reason and sometimes they're for a season. If your business rolls up into 15, 20, 30 million, you need to find a different coach. I'm not going to sit here and tell you I'm, that I've got all the answers for you. So uh, that's that's why I work in that bucket right there. So that's the growth phase, right? That's the yep. growth phase. So Yep, that's the so fun part. The fun part. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think it probably is the fun part. Um, so what characterizes a company that goes from well-funded startup to 10 million? What do you see over and over and over? What are the common threads? Because, you know, on this show, we're always looking for the, the secret sauce, right? So yep. what, what's the secret sauce here? So we, we call this the four areas that we focus on in our, in our mastermind and our coaching programs. And one is strategic business direction, right? What are you doing? Is it viable? Is it viable to build? Uh, can it actually scale to where you want it to scale? Number two is building high performance sales teams. Every, uh, every company in the world runs off sales. If you got no sales, you got nothing, right? So you need to be able to build a high performance sales team that generates a healthy ROI on whatever marketing dollars. And so we, we focus on that a lot. We do what's called measured profitable growth. Unlike venture capital, when I got bought out twice, they just throw money at things like crazy. Most of yeah. us that are building companies don't have millions of dollars to throw at stuff and lose it just to, to make a guess. So we try to, to build a company out of profits instead of out of, out of cash, we'll call it. Yeah. And then the last one is understanding your numbers. And this is the biggest weakness I find in this mm. uh, bucket. And under, it, it, this is weird. I've consulted for billion dollar companies that don't understand how to really break down numbers and do what I call bottom up P&L. Uh, instead of top down, build, build pinos from the bottom up. Uh, so if we can teach you how to understand your numbers, and then we can teach you how to do what we call historical PNL analysis using, uh, using trend factors and pattern recognition, then we can technically predict where your business is going to go in the future based on what it's done in the past and based on the decisions you're making today. It works amazing. It works 10 times better for franchise organizations, but we can also do this in the individual business uh, world as well. You'd be surprised how many entrepreneurs don't know their numbers. It's no, shocking. I, I, actually, I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> I would say almost none of them do. Yeah. Um, I'm uh, working with a founder called, who's, who's, who's been on the podcast called Ben Labra of Gesture, who's really, I call him the Babe Ruth of uh, entrepreneurs. He's really amazing. But uh, he's so good at the numbers that he wrote his own um, regression analysis uh, based on his own hard data such that he can predict within a percent or two, like every number, like yeah. he, he, he's not guessing. He kind of knows exactly what's going to happen to within one or 2% every month, you know? So mm -hmm. that means his predictions really mean something. That means he's, he's actually going to do it. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so what, what is the most important thing about numbers that entrepreneurs screw up? Pattern recognition and trend analysis is the biggest one that they don't okay. look at. And it's the biggest thing they need to, if they're going to understand, just like your friend, he probably does pattern recognition and trend analysis. He looks at everything that's happened and he can take that and predict what's going to happen next. Correct. And if you can predict what's going to happen next, then you know whether your decision is good, bad, or needs to be changed or doesn't. And that is just, it's unbelievably huge. Not only do they not know their numbers, they don't know how to analyze them to use it to predict the future. 
I, I think that's your next book. If you haven't written that one already, that, that sounds, <laughs> sounds like everybody could use that. But also I wanted to touch on sales because um, sales are funny. You know, it, it, it's um, um, I grew up in the editorial world where there was this thing called church and state and there was editorial and advertising and you were not supposed to cross that line. It was like a, you know, it was like a line you could not cross. Um, and so I grew up thinking sales was kind of, you know, not beneath me, but just like, eh, you know, it's not what I want to do. And then mm-hmm. I got a radio show and it turned out it was what I had to do. <laughs> if I wanted to eat. Um, but, you know, Thomas Watson of IBM said, um, the original Thomas Watson, who founded IBM, said that everything in life begins with a sale. Yeah. Um, and there's there's so much truth to that. But for somebody who feels like, you, you probably hear this a lot, I'm not a salesman, right? Well, mm-hmm. you and I know that every CEO, at the very least, has to be a salesman. They're selling all, all sorts of gotta things. You got to sell the product. vision. You got to sell the vision. You got to sell the product. So what do you say to the person who basically th- feels like, not only don't I know how to do this, I don't want to do this. What do, you do, what do you do in that case? Sure. You better find somebody who knows how to do it and is good at it. And I, I use so this analogy. You, yeah. real, I use yeah. this analogy. If you look at the profit and loss statement in any company, if you look at the sales team, the sales team generates revenue. In fact, they are the only revenue generation in your company. Everybody else in the company is in the expense column. Everybody, the CEO, the managers, the, the admin personnel, the sales yeah. manager, they are all expenses that have to be covered by the sales team. So the sales team is not just responsible for themselves, they're responsible for everything. So if you don't want to be good at sales, you better find somebody who is or bring a coach in to teach your sales organization how to crank those sales up or you're not going to have a company. I tell people all the time, you get rid of all the salespeople, you don't have a company. You get rid of all the managers, you still got sales. <laughs> right, you got money coming in. You got money. So, so how do you, um, how do you inculcate that in the organization in the sense that the way you've described it, you know, sales should be on a pedestal, right? But typically, it's not. It's it's seen as a necessity, right? It's not necessarily. It's not really. I don't think it's even seen as the core of the business. Oddly enough, so. Do you change the corporate culture to embrace sales or is there something else, some other tweak that you recommend in in that context? If your company wants to grow and if it really wants to blow it out and accelerate, you better build a good sales team. It's just that that's just all there is to it. The best product in the world is irrelevant if nobody sells it. So what does the best sales director, sales manager look like? Somebody who understands Okay, let me put it like this. If you're a sales manager or a sales director, your only job within the organization is to make your sales team better. Mm -hmm. If you're not making each and every one of those individuals better at what they do, then you are nothing but an expense. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Your job is to make them better. They need to perform at a higher level. Close ratios need to go up. ROIs need to go up. That's your job. If you're just a paper pusher, I can Mm -hmm. have anybody do that. So you need to understand the sales process. You need, and if you don't, Again, I do scales coaching all over the country. I'll come in and teach your sales organization. All you got to do is bring somebody in and let them do it. And yeah, yeah, no, will go up. that's great advice. I want to remind our listeners, you're listening to The Accelerator with Michael Conniff. We're a podcast for startups, founders, and entrepreneurs. Um, uh, we also try to speak to the family offices and um, investment firms and uh, accelerators and incubators and venture capitalists out there. Um and uh, uh, also want to remind you, we're on all the major platforms. Um, we really like it if you go to Substack. We're going to start pushing substack.theaccelerator.com um, or, and our, our uh, sister podcast, our sibling podcast, which is The Angel, where we talk to actually the money side, also on Substack, but on every platform you can think of. It's hard to miss it. Um, and, and I want to be, uh, uh, and I am extremely grateful to Brian Will. He's a serial entrepreneur and Twice a Wall Street Journal bestselling author. Those two books are The Dropout Multimillionaire, which he talked about, and also No, The Psychology of Sales and Negotiation, which we talked about a little bit, didn't we? We got there. A little bit, yeah. We got there. And uh, fresh off Necker Island, you look like you got a good tan. Uh, Maybe that's just living in Atlanta. But um, (laughs) uh, 
but uh, that that sounds like an unbelievable experience, and um, that's that's really something you can tell your grandkids, right? One of my best ever without my children. Well, thanks thanks for being on uh, the accelerator. Really appreciate it, Michael. It's been awesome. Thanks for having me. And thank you, everyone out there, for listening. And remember, we'll be back with another podcast before you know it.